Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've bitten a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, traders and investors. Welcome to this Wednesday Eyes of March edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. I'm Spencer Israel here with Joel Conan and Dennis Dick. On today's show, we're going to talk, of course, about that Fed meeting. Uh, we're going to get that decision today at 2 o'clock. We're also going to discuss Snap hitting those lows. Um, I saw there's a Twitter hack in Turkey. Maybe we'll discuss that. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure that we'll find more to discuss. Two guests for you today. First, at 8.35, we're going to be joined by Alice Andres France. She is the Chicago Bureau Chief at MT Newswire. And then at 9, we're going to have Yaron Golger. He's the co-founder and CEO of a company called I Know First. They they use AI uh, to forecast uh, stock prices. So we're going to get those two on the show. Joe, how are we doing on the S&Ps this morning? We're showing a little green on the screen, up 475 at 67.75. Kind of rallied right off that closing print of 63 even. That stands as your low. Major resistance up in Monday and Tuesday's high, 72 even. We'll see what happens if we take out the close, 23.63. Uh, Tuesday's low way down to 54.75. That looks safe for now. What a ride in crude oil. Uh, some uh, negative word out of Saudi Arabia. Didn't check the news last night. We came right down to 47. Nice back up to 49. So nice volatility if you are trading the crude oil market. But uh, under 50, that's one thing we know for sure. Gold and silver just kind of hanging out. They do move on Fed meetings. We have gold trading down a buck thirty, twelve oh one thirty. Kind of been in a little bit of a range here over the last three or four days. And silver has lost the seventeen dollar level, trading up not even a penny here. It's sixteen ninety three. Dennis, how you doing there today? Ah, doing okay. Kind of a slow day here. We got we're up over the market, and we're looking and waiting for what the Fed is going to say at two o'clock. And Joel, are you still predicting a half? Ah, uh, I'm not predicting it. I'm saying that's what they should do, just to get it over with, so we don't have to worry about that or just talk about it. But uh, what they'll say is, uh, you know, we're going to do it now, and we're data dependent. And, I mean, the news is already out. I mean, I don't know what, uh, you know, what, I mean, they know we're going to do it. It's factored in. I'll back off my half just because, you know, it would royal the markets too much. But uh, that's what I'm looking for, a quarter and data dependent. I mean, that's what they've been saying for how many years? Yeah, they're, go they're going a quarter. The question is, how hawkish or dovish are they going for it? Are they going to hint that we're going, you know, more this year? Or, you know, is this going to be a one and done? I don't think it's a one and done. I don't think the market thinks it's a one and done. But they get too hawkish, you know, then, you know, obviously, you know, financials would like that. And, you know, the question, you know, I think the biggest movers here, if you're going to trade this, is going to be the financials. And, you know, they've had a nice run up here anticipating, you know, at least a, a couple of rate rises this year. We're obviously going to get one today. But question is, is this priced in the financials? I think everybody is asking that question. You are seeing Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley trading up slightly here in the pre-market ahead of it. But, you know, they've been on an incredible run. We go back to November. Bank of America was $16 a share. We're now $25. J.P. Morgan back there under 60 or under $70 is now $91. Citigroup at $48 in November, $61 here now. How much more can these things go up? A lot. Oh, <laughs> why? <laughs> I, 
It's the trend. It, it enlighten mean, me. Why? Well, all right. Look at the Bank of America chart. I, the, I would agree, but why? Well, I don't, just look sell at this me, Bank of America. Okay. Bank of America. Oh, my God. What a run from 1205. Okay. But put it in perspective here. I mean, if you go to the monthlies, maybe the party's just getting going here, breaking out over 25. Maybe we're going to 37.50. You know, that was uh, the highs back uh, before the financial crisis. I mean, Look at this. This is breaking out of a, a long base here. I don't know what kind of projections that you want to do on this, but if we could consolidate here or just hang in here for another two months, you know, look at the move from 1250 to 25. I mean, you know, it's technically this thing could be going to 3750. That's a bullish target. That might be the most bullish target on the street, Joel, if you think it's going to 3750. But, you know, a lot of people think this is priced in. I think you have a lot of people saying it's been a ridiculous run. And that's the only reason I don't come in here short the financials coming into this. And I was actually thinking it three or four days ago. I was like, you know what? This could be a solid news. We actually played it a couple times. Remember, you know, I was saying after the ADP number, that was it was a, you know a hot jobs number there. And the financials rallied on it. I was like, I ain't going to fade that. And it did work out here. Um, and then it, there was another time there before that as well. But third time, I don't know. We'll have to see what they say here. But I'm scared to be sure financials going. And that. just keep your eye on the numbers. I mean, you know, if it takes out this 2580, which has been a huge level yep. high of the move, you got to figure there's 20 cents in it to 26, right? And then there's going to be a pound of, I mean, pound of stock at 26 just because it hasn't been there in like 100 years. So. You know, just look at the levels. And then if you close above 2580 or you close above the 26, then, you know, you just have to look at right now. I mean, this is a big stock. It trades very well according to the to the levels. And the last, you know, you got major support just above 25. The five out of the last six lows, 2508 to 2513, couple in there at 25, 22, and 23. So, Major support, 25 bucks. No downside until it takes that out. 2580 is the number on the upside. You don't have to make it too complicated. You know, trying to figure out what the Fed's going to do. Just look at that. Look at the charts. Yeah, I mean that's the nice thing about technical analysis is you don't have to worry about and try to figure out all that stuff. So, and I agree. I think you know you got to go with the flow here. This thing starts to break down through 25, it's going to be in some trouble there because there is some air below. You have a gap in the chart as well. And I agree. You know, you get up to 26. I think this probably be some size at the point. And how I yep. might approach it is I might be you know sitting out there. You know, if it's if this thing's at 25.40 and we get a nice pop on the number, it could have trouble getting through 26 the first time. So maybe I fade it that first time if it get up in the 25 90s because i think there is going to be some size of 26 that's bank america if i jump over to like a jp morgan that number would be actually up in 94 because with the high was 93 92 you can see a double top of their 93 98 i don't think it's got the gas to get up two points from where it's trading at right now but you never know you throw it out there and if it did you know i think you know it's going to fail at 94 here for the first time that's my opinion Morgan Stanley, that number, I'm just giving them all, would be probably 48 because the trade is high as 47.33. Maybe there's something at 47.5. I'm just looking at the charts and looking at the highs and saying, okay, well, when I see a double top around 98 in JP Morgan, it's telling me there's somebody sitting at the point. And if they were there a week and a half ago, they're probably still there. So that's why I'm saying 94 on JP Morgan. Citigroup number, now it actually took it out there. We knew there was some size of 62, and it took it out there four or five days ago. So now you probably got to go all the way up to 63 to find some size in the book, you know, that you can lean on maybe if you get, you know, some type of a hot number. And then uh, Goldman Sachs, the last one, it's significantly off its highs, though. So 255.15 is where we got up to. I mean, and Goldman's a $250 stock. So I don't know if this is going to apply to that. But the Bank of America set up I like. 26 bucks. I think you're going to have resistance. If we rally into that, I'm going to fade it, I think. I got a good number uh, Goldman Sachs here. Sure. Uh, what's the old time? I mean, did we make a new all time high here? Did we, uh, boom, boom? I think we did. Uh, the former all time Is it all time high? Is, is that, that not incredible? Really? Is that an all time well, let high? Me see. Let me see what it did. Before yeah. the financial crisis. We might, you might be right, Joel. I think you might be right. Holy mackerel. Let me check this thing out. Check uh, the financial before the financial crisis because we know after the financial. Yeah. We were in the 200s. Oh, I don't yeah. remember this, what, where we were in the 200s. Yeah. 250 70 was the old all-time high, and that was back in wow. October. But you know what? You can't you can't sell your financial stock until Jamie Dimon um, sells his, uh, <laughs> right? The, the Jamie, Jamie Dimon low, the Jamie Dimon high? 
Yeah, that's got kind of, memory. Wait for the Jamie Diamond bottom. I know we coined that. Everybody ripped it off. We were the ones, first ones that were saying that. We were saying like two days after it happened. Jamie Diamond could it be the Jamie Diamond bottom? And now everybody looks at it. They ripped us off on that. CNBC. They don't rip us off on much, but they ripped us off on that. I got to take a break to call my lawyer here. I want to sue them. I know. That was the one thing we coined. I'm giving ourselves <laughs> Actually, credit for that. Actually, you Jamie coined it, Dennis. Low. You coined it. I'm going to give you credit. <laughs> I'm giving myself credit for that Jamie Diamond low because we are the first people saying it. And we said it early, man. Like and, that day. Know, I remember that day we were saying, is Jamie Diamond coming in here buying? How this much could did be he the buy? confidence the How market much did he needs, buy that man. day? That know? was it. I should have just, you know, listed myself, bought all the bank stocks, then and been done with it. But Jamie Diamond low. So, okay, yeah. let's move on from the Wait, banks. one more Those thing. Be... One more thing. Yeah, yeah you should have uh, bought it then. And you know what else you should have bought it? You <laughs> talked me out of it after the whale trade. <laughs> exactly. I was, I, I was giving you a buy on it today. I was going to be nice to you. <laughs> okay. I'm still mad at you for that. That was when it was $28. I was going to buy it, and you're like, no, you'll get it at 26 <laughs> I never got it. Ninety-one fifty-one later. Ah, and that was going to my investment portfolio. I hold stuff in that investment portfolio. Unlike my day trading portfolio, which I can't hold anything. I'm mad. I'm having a mad day here today because I bought Tesla at the open yesterday. And you look at it, you're like, whoa, you must have made a lot of money on it. I was like, no, nah, scalper blood got me on this one. But anyway, so I, the reason I bought Tesla yesterday, we knew Andrew left, said it on CNBC, covered it. It popped on that news a little bit. And I was like, you know, he said some other stuff in that interview, which made me you know, think, that the market might, you know, come in here buying Tesla uh, yesterday. This would have been yesterday morning. And it traded up in the pre-market for a lot of the morning. And then it opened down, actually. It opened down by about a dime. So I bought that opening print. I took zero heat. Literally within like a minute, I'm up a p- point and a half. Of it. And I'm like, okay, you know, I got I should hold on to this one. This could be a good one. But I got the scalper blood in me, so I can never hold. And this is a day trading account. That's why I have different accounts. My investment account, I hold great. But this was just a day trade. And I was like, but, you know, I was thinking... You know, some people might come in here and actually like this. But then it sat and chopped around a little bit in the 246s and 247s. And finally, I got fed up with it, and I sold it for like a buck. And about an hour later, it blasted off into orbit. It goes from 248 to 258 by the end of the day. So I would have never taken any heat on the trade. I took my point. The scalper bled in me again. And I'll have 10 points on the table. Ah! You know what I think it is, too? I mean, I know that it, uh, they mentioned that, uh, you know, Laugh covered his short. That was Monday after the close. So that, you know, that got it going a little bit. And Chris Saka had a tweet. But I think Intel and the autonomous, you know, vehicles and the drive, I think that that has peaked a little. I'm not saying it's getting taken over by anybody. But the fact that they bought yeah. the mobile eye, I think that has some people in the back of their minds. Uh, well, that was the whole Andrew left argument on CNBC yep. was that mobile eye getting bought by Intel. He's like, and we even said on the show yesterday, left was saying, you know, maybe Tesla should consider spinning off their you know business, you know, that part of the business that's like mobile eye, you know, and, and and there's a lot of you know bullishness to this sector there right now. And Tesla was a little sleepy giant. And it took off there yesterday. And you know I like my two-day move. So I don't know if this is going to be a one and done here or not. I wouldn't be surprised this thing tacked on another five or six points here today. Now, I should go and put my OPG order out there right now because I'll probably forget to put the order out there. I get sidetracked at the open. I'll get caught up trading my financials. But I don't know. I, I wouldn't be surprised this thing uh, blasts off again. So I think you could see 264, 265 today. Just a prediction. Obviously, I don't know anything. I don't have a crystal ball. But I'm pretty mad at myself for buying a 246 yesterday or 246.10 at the open and selling a 247.5 and, and watching it blast at 258 by the end of the day. That scalper blood, Joel, still get me. All right. Uh, Brad D. wants us to talk about Macy's. The real estate holdings are valued at close to the current stock price. But there's a question. I mean, who would buy this thing? I mean, well, and, and that's that's the big question here. Um, Hudson's Bay was rumored before, but now there was rumors Hudson's Bay was going to buy uh, Neiman Marcus, who is private now. That was actually rumored last night from Deal Buck. So you know, Hudson's Bay is snooping around to buy something. Um, are they going to come and scoop Macy's up? I don't know. Uh, you got a 4.88 percent dividend. You've got. You know, the, the question I have for Macy's is, yes, I agree with the real estate, but you could have said the same thing on Sears Holdings. And Sears Holdings has been an absolute disaster. They were saying, you know, the real estate had value and the thing was at 30 bucks. It's at eight now. So I don't want to be stuck in a Sears. And that's why I just can't pull the trigger for some reason. I want to pull the trigger on this Macy's. I think, you know, there could be more rumors that perk up here and give it another lift. I think you got even a good level. 30 bucks, man. Like if you're buying it here at $30.95, 
You give yourself, it starts cutting under 30, then, you know, all bets are off. So we risk a buck here. Maybe, you know, you've tried to pick up three, four points on a rumor. I don't know if anybody's going to come in and actually buy them, but I wouldn't be surprised if another rumor had surfaced again. You saw what happened back in February, going back to February 6th when the stock had the big pop in the charts, or February actually, uh, grab me, February 3rd. The stock was at 3011. Rumors came out that Hudson's Bay was sniffing around the stock, went to 34 bucks. That could happen again. No, rumors could happen again. I don't think anybody's buying them, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's more rumors. Brad D, why don't you just buy Amazon? I, I needed, uh, some, what was it? I needed some T-shirts or something, and I'm like, well, you know, the Kmart around me closed or something. So, I, I, you know, I had I, my personal shopper, Lisa, just get on Amazon, bing, bang, and, uh, you know, they'll be here in two days. I mean, it's just so easy, and I guess the millennials are doing more shopping on Amazon. So instead of buying the Macy's, buy the Amazon. I mean, the uh, whole world's uh, going to be on Amazon. Buying I everything. saw a good tweet uh, yesterday and for, from Mark Yusko, who we've had on the show before. Uh, great follow, obviously, at Mark Yusko. Um, so somebody tweeted at him, and he re, you know how you can uh, post the tweet and then you give your commentary with it. So the, the tweet that was posted at, at him was from The Cooler. And it was, I'm starting to think that Amazon is cheap and a- Apple is expensive. And then Mark Yusko said, Apple has made more profit last quarter than Amazon has ever made over 20 years. Huh. That's a hell of a quote. <laughs> Mark Yusko. So you can see Mark Yusko saying, I don't know if I say Amazon is cheap relative to Apple. Yeah, Apple's made more money, more money in the last quarter than Amazon's made in it the last 20 years. Hmm. That's interesting. All right, I'll buy it. Yeah. But obviously, Amazon, we know, reinvest in their company for growth, and they could make more money if they want to. There's the argument on the other side. But uh, Apple still makes a hell of a lot of money, man. All right. Uh, Oracle preview here, uh, earnings after the close. It's really gotten hit hard the last couple quarters. But, man, look at that. Battled all the way back yes. here. I guess, look at this thing. Do you, do you... Rewind the tape, Joel. Do you remember me saying this when it got hit last quarter? This thing is like Groundhog Day all over again every single quarter. It seems, it seems like every quarter the stock gets hit to the tune of 5 to 10%, depending on, you know, the flavor of the earnings report. And by the next quarter, it's got all the losses back and it's back up there again, and they hit it again in the next quarter. It's happened two or three times. I said it on the show that day. If you go back and listen to the December, it would have been the December 16th show, I guess, because they reported the night. And you can see the big gap down the chart. I remember saying it, that, you know, when the dust settles here in three months, Oracle's going to be probably higher than it was, you know, the day before, and going to get all these losses back. So- well, it took about two months. To get them back, and then it blasted off another two points in the next month. So here we are, back up at 42 so now Everybody forgets about the last quarter, but it seems like Oracle always disappoints. So should we go all, all in short here? Just all in on the 43 puts? <laughs> and just... Maybe they're going to pull the wool over our eyes this time. I don't know. It's worked It's worked like two, three times though in the past. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, 43.26. Is that an all-time high here? I mean, you've also had a strong – ooh, look at that. No, 46.71. We hit that in uh, the middle of 2014, and then wait. What about going back all the way to 2000? I am. Though? Wasn't Oracle higher in the financial uh, crisis? Oh, the boy. Technical? You want to talk about a technical formation here. The high in, uh, boom, boom, this was. Tech bubble. Yeah, the tech bubble. September, it was a little bit earlier here. It was, let me go to my other chart here. Uh, that high was 46.47. Oh my gosh, you talk about a, t- a double top. It went to 46.71 when it made that run in 2015. Uh, you can see here that was September of 2046.47. Then you hit 46.71 in December of 2014. Coming up a little shy here. If it does get a good pop though off the report. Instead of going down, look at this $45 area. One, two, three, four months in a row made a high just under 45 So if you get a good report, you're looking maybe to lighten up 45 on the downside. After it got hit after the last report, it drifted lower. I mean, if you would have bought it that day, you still took some heat. But once it came back above that price, uh, above 39 bucks, that was a pretty uh, heatless trade. I feel like there's going to be some size in the book of 44. So if you get a pretty good report, I think that's a number where, you know, unless it really blows it away, that might be a number where it pauses uh, 44. If they come out and do what they usually do, the thing will get hit, though, and it'll be back down at 41 or 40. But um, 
I just want to go back to that chart. You know, you look at that 2000, you know, the, the long-term chart, the 17-year chart you put on, and don't tell me valuation doesn't matter. Because back then, you had Oracle with the price earnings multiple of like 60 or 50 or whatever it was. And it's just had to grow into that multiple. And it's taken 17 years for it to come, you know, and now it trades with a multiple. I don't know why, I don't have it in front of me, but it's probably like 14 or 15 or maybe even less than that. But I mean, if you're paying 50 or 60 times and growth just starts to slow a little bit, you're cooked. And that's what happened with Oracle. That's what happened with everything back in the tech bubble there. So when you're coming in here and buying these snap, you know, they, those types of stocks with these valuations, well, you can't even value it on PE multiple because it doesn't make any money, may never make money. But, you know, it, it's scary. That's why I've always been in my invest portfolio, uh, you know, and I've, you know, I've been through, you know, the tech, the, the financial crisis. I've been through the tech bubble, and I know what happens when you buy long term these PEs of 50, 60, 70. You usually get hurt at the end of the day when the dust settles. And that's why, you know, I sit here and I can't buy, you know, these stocks that have these crazy valuations. Uh, let's t take a look at the old snapperoo here. Uh, got under $20. Well, I see a 2015 low yesterday. Uh, you said it traded under 20 in the pre-market. Did it get down? 1986, boy. That's been an ugly-looking chart here. No 50% bounce when it made those lows. I mean, yeah. you got to think about 17 bucks, right? You know? Oh, look at B. Morris enjoyed the snap put options. Congratulations. Uh, but... I, I actually did short some snap yesterday. I just covered it there, though. Um, just off. I think it might bounce off 20 here again. Um, I know yesterday it bounced off 20. You actually have uh, you had a Cantor coming out, initiating with an underweight, putting a price target of 18 on it. 20 bucks is a bogey here, though. It starts taking that out, you know, then I'm thinking I'm thinking this thing could actually see it. Was it 18, the IPO price, or 17? I can't remember. 17. Now. Yep. 17? Yep. It, yep. Could, it could be in the cards. So, uh, but in any regard here, this snap valuation is just scary, and the chart doesn't look good either. So, I'm out on snap. I'm no position right now. I had a little short. I covered it this morning in the low 20s. And I'll see what happens at 20 bucks. Was it a hard borrow, or did you get it right away? Uh, no, it was, no, it actually wasn't bad. You know, it's, the snap was easy. Okay. So there is shares out there on snap now. Ed Parker's getting down and dirty. He sold the July 17 puts and snap. So uh, the oh, whole that's people, a bullish yeah, bet. Yeah, it is. So the yeah, a couple bucks. Well, if you think the IPO price holds, I mean, maybe that's not a bad bet. So it all depends on, you know, it all, and, and, and we got, you got to remember just because, you know, you, you give an argument and you say valuation doesn't make any sense. It doesn't mean these valuations can't, you know, get stretched or they can't get crazy. So, you know, it's always, you know, can't just come in here blindly shorting things and saying, ah, it's valuation is crazy. I'm going to short it. We could have did that on the $24 opening and have been up at 29 in your face. So, you know, you want the technicals to align right. I always say, you know, I look to, you know, my ideas, you kind of think of the fundamentals and then you do the technicals for the time. And, you know, the timing looks a little bit better here, except we're back at a big hole number of 20 bucks. And that's why, you know, first time down at 20, it bounced a little bit yesterday. It all depends on what it does at 20. The snap, you know, it's got the underway for Cantor today with the price target at 18. Maybe that takes it under 20. If so it's taking under 20, I think it could see 19 or even 18. So, you know, I might jump back in this if it breaches 20. But as of right now, I'm out just because first time it down at 20. We know Ace talks with these psychological um, uh, numbers here as well. And we talk a lot about on the show. They work. The big hole numbers sometimes are bounce levels. All right. Uh, really no great earnings to speak of today, kind of out of the end of earnings season. Where, where would you like to go next? Well, we, we previewed Oracle. So let's just go to the ratings parade here. There is a few here to talk about this morning. Uh, we've got Netflix first getting upgraded to hold at Jefferies. And Netflix is trading up here in the pre-market. And this stock is one, you know, this is one that I've given a valuation argument on this a long time. And I've been wrong for a long time. And I'm glad I haven't been short it. Because, you know, I didn't like this thing at 100 bucks and like it at 110, 120, 130, 140. It keeps going up. I still don't like it long term. I think the valuation is crazy. I think eventually it's going to come back down to earth. But who knows when that is? You know, it's still loved by the street. It actually sets up not bad here right now. You know, you start getting above 145, 146, it's in breakout mode again. And we know we're in this relentless bull market. So, you know, I don't want to be short it, even though I don't like the company long term. Uh, at these valuations. Major support at 140 and change. A couple lows under 140, then a couple just above it. So until that level's taken out, room on the upside. 
Forty-four thirty. That's where it's trading. You got a higher print in the uh, in the pre-market of forty-four ninety-eight. Uh, take it out this high, forty-four forty-nine. Now that's a level to keep an eye on. That's your February twenty-third high. Uh, the only high that you have above that is the all-time high of one forty-five point ninety-five. Also got CSX getting upgraded to buy at Atlantic. You've got Intel downgraded here at Credit Suisse. That's a little late to the party. Full disclosure, I do a small position in Intel, which I'm getting hit on here tonight, or to this morning. Uh, 34.92 is where it's trading on in the pre-market. Uh, Spencer, anything else jumping out at you from ratings land that we didn't cover here? Uh, just a lot I, of smaller ones. I saw a downgrade to uh, WebMD, which struck me as interesting, because I would have thought with uh, with the new healthcare plan that people are going to want to be looking up their symptoms on online now. Uh, and be their own doctor. So, but downgrade WebMD uh, by Cowan. Uh, what else did What's I What's WebMD ticker again? WBMD. I do not trade that one. Uh, what else did I no see? No trades today. No. Um, Harley Davidson upgraded by Longbow Research uh, to neutral. And nope. Advanced Auto Parts. No, reiterated. Nah, that's it. Uh, let's take a look here. Uh, Diana Dawn here wants our opinion on GSIT here. I uh, had a nice move yesterday. Wow. Yeah. Uh, GSI Tech uh, trading up in the pre market. Let's see if we. There must have been uh, some news on this thing the last couple days. Uh, they had. No, earnings not. Uh, they actually missed on their Q3 on uh, revenues and EPS. There must. You seen any other uh, any other news on this, Dennis? This thing had a real nice move yesterday. Uh, it's actually had a three-day move and it's trading above the high from yesterday. I guess you just got to keep an eye on the eight-dollar level. Closed right on it. There must be something cooking in this stock here. If, uh, had the big jump up. Let's see if you can. When I see things like this, I try and February seventeenth. Uh, spiking up. Do you see any news on this thing, Dennis? At all? This well, I mean, there's got to be news on it no, here. I so, see you know, when you have moves like this, it's typically, it looks like, what was the news back on February 17th? That's what I want to know. <laughs> that's what I'm because looking Because that's when to. it really started blasting out, 570 to 706. So, maybe Diane, can, Diane, if she's following this company, can enlighten us here, too. Because obviously something happened. I don't have my news search up here just in front of me on the live radio show right now. So, Spencer, if you want to hunt in the background, too. I don't um, see GSIT, I do not follow this company, though, so. 859, I'll just give you a level. That's uh, people that have owned the stock since May 2011. 859 was a high that month, and it closed down at 701 and kind of broke down from there. So 859, if it goes into rally mode, uh, also a nice round number at $9. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a volatile thing. Keep an eye on that closing price of $8. OXY, Dr. J wants to know about their catch and upgrade here uh, from Bank of America, and the stock is trading up with oil here this morning. I didn't see that one. Was that OXY? It was upgraded, eh? So I've, usually Dr. J knows his stuff, so I'm assuming he's right on that one. Um, 64.01 is where it's trading at. We're getting a big lift with oil here, though. All your oil stocks are very strong here this morning off that number there from yesterday at 4.30. So OXY, trade up a buck. Ah, trading up a buck. Is there any kind of volume with this move here? 6402. 64, that's the number that jumped right out to me here. Uh, that looks like that's your five day high at 64, even then you're getting into a gap area. So as long as you hold 64, I think you got some room between 64 and 65. But man, it just if you're along this thing, you've got a lot of company. This thing is. Uh, just been slaughtered since uh, the middle of December, coming down to 73. So it ain't just going to pop right back up. But uh, right now, to me, 64, right where it's trading, looks like a, a good level if it could take that out as he continued upside. Uh, just jump in here to a couple other stocks that I had on my list. GoPro, the two-day move, did work yesterday, and it uh, stock opened right at the high of the day, and obviously gave all the way back to seven dollars and sixteen cents for settling at seven twenty-two. So, uh, two-day move in GoPro, and then Fitbit too had a little bit of a two-day move as well, breaking down. Both these stocks are in a world of hurt here, but. Joel, quick levels, GPRO. Is there anything on oh, your radar man. here? Or when you're breaking down to new lows, it's just time to go? Uh, just keeping, you know, see if it makes like a double bottom here, GPRO. And I just, 
I want to talk about this after one second. Two big down days in a row. 724 is the close. Let's keep an eye on 716. I mean, shorts have to cover, you know, eventually. But uh, I wish I could find the article because we were talking about that AUPH yesterday. Uh, remember when that GoPro was 80, 85, 90 bucks and JP Morgan let the, the founders out of some stock? It was restricted stock and they let them out of it to sell it. Do you remember that, Dennis? Oh, was, yeah, that was the high. Yeah. We talked about it on the show, I think. Yeah, yesterday. we talked about it yesterday. And uh, 9847, I think they got rid of that stock between 80 and 90. What, I mean, what a sell there. I don't know if they got rid of all their stock, but uh, look how this thing is coming in. 716 yesterday's low. Uh, maybe a whole number, seven bucks, might give a little psychological support as well. Uh, jumping over here just to a few other stocks. Twitter is trading down here in the pre-market. I'm kicking myself on this one, too. I bought it yesterday on the open. I actually held this one all day. guess I should have sold this one. I put it in my swing trading account, though, and I was like, I'm going to hold on here and see if I can get, you know, 50 cents to a buck on it. Well, I was almost up 50 cents because I bought it yesterday at the open, like 15, 15, and it went up to 58. And I watched um, all the way back down. Now I've watched it come all the way back down to the price where I bought it at. So... Bad timing, or I guess, you know, bad, good entries yesterday for me and bad exits yesterday or lack of exit on Twitter here. It's all the way back down. I guess the hack may be hitting it here a little bit this morning. So, obviously, full disclosure, I'm still long a little bit of Twitter in my swing trading account. Breach is 15. That was going to be my out. That's still my out if it takes out 15, but not in love with it now after, you know, giving back most of its gains yesterday and this hack overnight. What was this hack all about, Spencer? Uh, I think it was in Turkey, a, b a bunch of accounts were hacked and they tweeted uh, s uh, swastikas and uh, yeah. pro propaganda about uh, Erdogan, who's the, the, the president there, and that, I think that's really it. 1494 yeah. has been the low of the move here. Uh, nice volume bump up yesterday, Dennis. It traded uh, 8700000 on Monday, but uh, up to $15 million on Tuesday, so little buyers on an update. Try and hang in there with the Twitter. Yeah, I'll hang in if it breaches. Should I give it to 1494? Maybe I should probably give it to yeah. the low 1494. But we'll give it to that on the swing trade. Takes that out. I'm out of there. All right, 8.33, we so we're not quite. we got to get two more stocks in maybe here. Momo, uh, Cajun One was asking about. M-O-M-O, -O, that stock has been a monster. Had a huge move there four days ago. Gave it all back and then had the huge move again yesterday. I think you're starting to see some resistance form up there around $34 there. M-O-M-O, -O, quick technical thoughts on this one, Joel. Yeah, boy, this thing is uh, volatile here. Let me take a look at it. Nice run up. It was a... <laughs> nine dollar stock back in june and we just i just don't like those yo-yo days like that uh yesterday's close was at 33.66 a high 33.80 i mean you're up here near all-time high territory 34.35 that was your march 8th high that was the all-time high i don't know with this you just want to clear another whole number close above you know even if you don't take out the all-time high at 34.35 Clear out the whole number, settle above it for another leg up. But uh, not sure what your original target was this or, you know, what uh, your expectations. Trading down a little bit in the pre-market on a couple thousand shares. Man, you really can't even say there's great support until you get down to the double bottom at the 3050 area. Ace talking K-O-O-L up 34% here this morning. You're starting to see some of these smaller biotech stocks show some life there. Uh, K-O-O-L here uh, getting a big lift here. And it seems like every day we get two or three of these that are popping. You know, always a case you get like a, usually get, you know, one or two of these. But it just seems like lately a lot of these ones that have been in the doghouse have been coming back. And K-O-O-L has just been the sleepy giant there. And boom, it's your flavor of the day and popping 34% here this morning. Uh, give us a level here, Joel. But I just want to make that note that, you know, there's a lot of these smaller little biotechs that have come back quite a bit here lately four bucks at your pre-market high Let's see if the seller remains there you did have a spike if you can clear four dollars 455 has been your high for the year uh last stock here fenisar now this one i, I know we've been talking about this got hit after earnings yeah and it hasn't found a bottom yet i still can't really tell you where to hop in this yeah. stock look at that continued lower three days in a row i don't know maybe hold out for uh the higher 23s you got a gap to fill from september but uh 
Right now, the post-earnings move, man, anybody that bought it on that first day on the dip is still underwater. Let's yeah. see if we can uh, fill the gap. Spencer? Upgraded this morning. It was upgraded by Jefferies to a buy, so that is why it's up 1.5% here this morning. But we saw that a couple of days ago, exactly. it caught an upgrade, and then it just gave it back again. So I wouldn't be surprised if something similar happened here. We got a guest? We do have a guest, Alice Andres French, the Chicago Bureau Chief for M. Newswires, and uh, she's really good with macro themes. So we'll be right back with Alice. Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. I'm Spencer Israel, here with Joel Elkanen and Dennis Dick, and we're on the line now with Alice Andres France, the Chicago Bureau Chief for MT Newswires. Alice, how's it going this morning? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. It's a good day to have you on. We have this Fed meeting today. Uh, give us a quick preview of what you think uh, we're going to be seeing this afternoon. Right. Well, the market has pretty well anticipated that the Fed will deliver a rate hike today. Um, the bigger thing is that they put out the summary of economic projections. They do this at their quarterly meetings, and these are pretty key indicators. They're going to give us their projections on um, changes in real GDP, the unemployment rate, PCE inflation, and core PCE. And those projections go out not only this year, but they go out 2018, 2019, and then longer run. And that helps us or the marketplace to shape their ideas of where the path of Fed funds are going. Now, in uh, they did these projections in December, and they were a little bit changed from the September projections. And to be quite honest, the market is not anticipating big changes here. Um, they're anticipating that um, for 2017, they'll keep the core PCE inflation around 1.8 and the unemployment rate at the end of 2017. Their projections will still be um, 4.5. Now, that's just a shade below. Both of those projections are just a shade below where we are. Um, we have the unemployment rate at 4.7% and the core PCE at one7 So the marketplace is really buying into the fact that we will converge onto those projections towards the end of the year. The other part of it is that the Fed will deliver what we call a dot plot. And that gives us, it's just a little chart, and it has 10 little dots on it from each of the voting members. And it gives us an idea of where this group thinks that the median for Fed funds will be. Um, in, in December, they thought that at the end of 2017, Fed funds would be around 1.4. That is actually exactly what the market is pricing in. Um, the market is pricing in about two to three hikes for the end of 2017. And I have to say um, that the market is pretty good at pricing in what they think the Fed will do. And a lot of that comes from what the Fed tells us in their speeches. I will also tell you that the, these probabilities and this strong likelihood for a Fed hike today have been priced into the market since February 28th. Now, what happened on February 28th was Trump spoke to the joint economic, uh, the joint Congress, and the market interpreted his speech as very, very bullish for the economy. 
um, traders interpreted that as, hey, this is a Goldilocks trade again. Let's buy stocks. Let's buy the dollar. We saw massive money moving into the U.S. equity market from key players, longer-term players like pensions, real money accounts, insurers, and, and that fueled this big rally that we saw in the, in the early part of March. We're on the and line with – oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Alice. And then after that, what happens is the Fed, being this res- – completely responsible body goes out and they allow their key players, meaning the voters on on the FOMC, to go out and talk. And that's exactly what happened. You had a number of them coming out and saying, use this as an opportunity to hike. We want to stimulate and, and move in the right direction of taking accommodation off. Um, a lot of them projecting, yes, I see two to three some even said four rate hikes this year. And then the big key would, uh, was Yellen, and um, she spoke twice uh, in March, and she said, you know, we would like to gradually raise rates. And the market interpreted that as meaning this will happen today. Alice Andre France, uh, she's the Chicago Bureau for Chief MT Newswires. Now, you've been doing this for two decades here, covering global rates, equities, central banks and just everything under the globe. Could you just talk about, like, how your job has changed, how your resources have changed over the last 20 years, uh, you know, to provide all this information? Uh, Not only is, uh, you know, the markets changed, but just the flow of information. Could could you touch on that, please? Sure. Um, Well, within any industry, as you've seen over the last, you know, decade, um, regulation has really tightened up. And um, so what has happened as a result of that is fewer and fewer people want to speak freely to you. So what ends up having to happen is that you have to have really, really solid sources and relationships built on trust um, where you will get people to talk to you or continue to talk to you. And so what has to happen is I have to be very, very credible to my sources to continue to get them to speak to me. Um, But also we have to have, you know, a really solid line of trust to keep them talking to me because there's so much pressure from above. Do not talk to reporters. Do not put anything in writing. Do not say anything that they could record and use against us. So... That's one of the big changes uh, over time. I think that um, news agencies have had a very difficult time getting, you know, the real story on what what is behind the market and what's behind moves. And uh, could you, I mean, are you watching stuff around the clock? I mean, do you ever get any sleep? I mean, global (laughs) rates, central banks, micro themes, I mean... A lot of things happen while the markets are closed. In fact, a lot of the big moves in this bull market have occurred in overnight sessions. I mean, how, how do you manage your time? Right. You know, it's funny because when you are a reporter covering the financial markets, anything that you hear on the news, even when you're just, you know, after hours, you're like, that's the immediate thing that you think of is, oh, that will hurt stocks. Oh, this will help bonds or this will hurt the dollar. Um, but, you know, you just kind of naturally do that over time and it doesn't become burdensome. It becomes just a, another part of the puzzle that you put together every day. Alice, we've seen a dentist here. We've, we've seen a lot of strength here in the U.S. dollar. And, you know, some of that's fueled by Trump here. Uh, what, 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 what are your sources saying, you know, looking forward, you know, on the U.S. dollar here towards, you know, maybe going into the summer? Do they think the U.S. dollar is going to continue to strengthen against something like the euro? Or do they think, you know, that the U.S. dollar is maybe, you know, it's time to take some profits? Well, I mean, I think that what is going on is the market doesn't want to go in one direction. Certainly, I think that people think that the dollar is going to strengthen. I've actually heard projections of it strengthening to the point of where it would be, the euro would be 0.8 to the dollar. And, wow. um But things don't generally go in a straight line. They want to retrace. So I think that with a gradual Fed, and with some hurdles that are huge and we need to cross, and those being, you know, tax reform and this ACA, I think that um, the, the dollar won't move in one direction. We will have these back-and-forth moves. But overall, the 
the dollar will continue to strengthen, but it, it'll it'll be a gradual path. And just on that theme, just talking, you know, where we are going with, with uh, commodities, and I just want to look at the U.S. dollar maybe versus something like the Canadian dollar because the con- commodity market here, we've had, you know, we last year, this time, oil's getting murdered, and we've bounced mm-hmm. back so far in oil, you know, we've come back a long ways, but we're starting to leak here again, you know, and we're back under $50 a barrel, and some people are getting concerned here about oil going forward, and, you know, just talk about where, you know, where your projections maybe on oil along with maybe, you know, what that means for U.S. versus Canadian dollar, if you follow the U.S. Canadian dollar. Well, here's the deal on oil is that 55 on WTI has been a really tough hurdle. I don't think that that I don't think that that's going to change at all. Um, I think that between 45 and 55, and boy, that sounds really, really boring, but I think that that's just going to be the case. And if you can range trade that, I think that that's the way to go because once you get above 55, all these shale producers are going to come back online right. and they're just going to flood the market, and that's just the fact. Um, I think that we learned late last year that $80 a barrel, $100 a barrel, that is over. And I have not read anybody, anybody that is projecting higher than $65, $70. And I think that that even would be like an anomaly. Okay. Um, So I think that that is one of the bigger keys, um, that oil is going to stay in this range. And I actually think that that will help the economy. And if you think about oil, in February 2015, when the market started to melt down, right, that completely impacted um, the U.S. economy. And, and people were telling me, companies were telling me, oh, you know, this lower oil price, this is really affecting my business, especially here in the Chicago area, because believe it or not, we pro- uh, the Chicago area provides a lot of um, things for the oil and gas market. Um, people were also telling me that, um, you know, and that continued through, um, like it, it continued for at least a year and a half, but now with oil really not recovering to those big levels, people think that the market is okay because we have so many other things going on. See, in February, 2015, we didn't have a big infrastructure plan. We weren't going to have big tax reform. We weren't going to have all these big things happening. So now with oil at the level of where it is, but also the promise of all these big things that could stimulate the economy and then get the consumer going again, I think that that's that's a very positive thing for the economy. As for the dollar Canada, um, it's really not something that I follow that much, so I can't really speak to that. All right, just going back here, I told you I was going to ask ask you a tough question. You know, you've been in the markets for 20 years. You've gone through, you know, the tech bubble. You went through the financial crisis. You know, here we are, what, 10, 11 years past the financial crisis. Our banks seem to be, you know, uh, past that. I mean, you know, is there anything out there, you know, you know, looming that, of course, the next thing that's going to rock the market is going to, you know, be unpredictable. Is there is there any sector of the account like the retail stocks or you know, is what out there? What the REITs, is there anything out there that, you know, kind of said, man, if this thing starts going south, this could really have a bad impact on the mm-hmm. market. Yeah. I think that the key sector that people are watching is high yield. Um, we've seen that get hit back uh, recently and people are they eye that every time that it gets a little bit weak. Um, I think that that continues to be a sector that you want to watch. And I think that there's very valid points in that, right? Because risky markets during the financial crash were the detriment to our society. So I think that that is very valid to watch the high yield sector. I think that you see like retail get wobbly and then all of a sudden it bounces back. Um, You see REITs get wobbly and then they bounce back. Um, so for that reason, I would pinpoint watching the high yield market. Um, and then in terms of events for the rest of the year, you know, we definitely have, we're going to get um, the final results on this Dutch election and the French election, but please make no mistake. Those two big elections, while people are hyping it all up, has far less significance than the U.S. election had. So yeah, it might be a blip in the radar, um, but I don't think that those are as important or the market is not interpreting those as 
as important as what happened with the U.S. election. And after those events pass, which will be um, you know, later on in the second quarter, it's kind of smooth sailing, and we can you know, watch the economy do what it's supposed to do. We have been on the line with Alice Andres France, the Chicago Bureau Chief at MT Newswires. Alice, thanks so much for joining us today. Love the analysis, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. All right, we're back. S&P's barely moving here, up five and a quarter, 68 and a quarter. Pre-market high, 70 and a quarter. Dennis, is there any notable imbalances out there? Uh, there is, actually. There's a few interesting ones. Snap, obviously, it's getting that underway from Cantor here today. That's got 69000 to sell, and it is trading down 2% here in the pre-market. I'm still keeping my eye on, out on $20 level, though, because that could be the first bounce level. It takes that out, then, you know, could get interesting on the downside. Nike, 36000 to sell. That's interesting because it's trading higher in the pre-market here. Uh, Bank America, 99000 to buy. Some of your financials are strong here this morning, just ahead. Of you know, people obviously expecting that rates are going to go up here today. Pfizer forty-seven thousand to sell, AT and T forty-one thousand to sell, Verizon sixty thousand to sell, Walmart fifty thousand to sell, Johnson and Johnson fifty-two thousand to sell. So some of the defensive stocks, more of the dividend plays, are seeing a little bit of selling balances here this morning, and that again is probably just positioning ahead of today's Fed decision at two o'clock. So maybe you got a few institutions that want to take some size off there at the open. All right. Uh, what else do we got here? We got uh, crude still trading up here, eighty-seven cents at forty-eight fifty-nine. Uh, GM. Just looking at all the different stocks here. I mean, what uh, what do you think is going to be? You know, the besides the financials, what do you think is going to be the second biggest sector impact by this Fed decision? Uh, it's going to be the defensive stocks. So, you know, talking like you're, you know, with the bond. Well, first, you got to look at the TLT, and that's obviously going to move here. So maybe you want to do a quick technical on the TLT. It's the best way to look at the bonds. I mean, we have been hit ahead of this decision, you know, to the tune of, you know, look at where we were back in November. We were $135. Now we're 117 Bonds have been hit. There's no doubt about it because obviously if interest rates are going up, it's bad for bonds. Question is, is it priced in? That's the biggest question because we've had such a move. Even in the last, you know, two weeks from March, TLT was up at 122. We're back down here at 117. These are big moves. You know, this is a 3 4% move here on the TLT, which is significant for an instrument that typically doesn't move that much. So that's the biggest question is how much of this is priced in? How hawkish are they going to be going, you know, in their tone going forward? Does it sound like, you know, that they're going to be, you know, they're, you know, like you said, they're going to say data dependent, but do they sound like, you know, they're, they're thinking, you know, that if this continues on this merry way, that they're going to go up a couple more times this year? Because, you know, then obviously something that TLT could continue to get hit. But if there's any hints that, you know, well, we're going to raise this and then we're going to take a look, you know, and not do anything too, you know, extreme, you could actually see something like the TLT rally on the numbers. So I think it, not, it doesn't matter so much what they do, because I think it's expected that they're going to go a quarter. It matters what they say going forward. See, now I look at this chart here, the TLT, we have it up here, and, you know, the trend is your friend, it's going down, the logical thing is just to buy puts, right, it's just gonna, but, you know, I look at this chart, and it's just so hard not to be a contrarian here, Dennis, uh, you know, went off the board, it, uh, it made a low of the move two days ago, 116.49, uh, up at 117.07, let's see what it's doing in the pre-market, it's trading up, in up the a little bit. Uh, up a little bit. I mean, talk me out of, uh, I'm going to put it up here. Talk me out of buying like the 116 and a half, 117 calls here. Uh, the weekly calls. This would be I just talked you out of buying options all together. <laughs> That's okay. the one thing is, and you know, we've learned so much from Nick Shaheen having him on the show for the last couple of years. And you know, I've learned as well is you don't make money long-term buying options unless you're you know you're just the but you know and, and maybe there's if you are by any if you're listening to the show and you're like i don't agree with that i've made money buy options continue to do it i mean continue to you know buy options if that's you know what has been making you money but i'll tell you from my 18 year professional experience i've never made money buying options um you know 
lottos, you know, are a little different story. Sometimes I like to do a little lotto trade. Nick likes those too, but you're paying very low premium there for a very outlier shot of something coming in. But, you know, we get lots of, you know, people here, you know, new people coming to the feed. We got, you know, somebody, RGS is just coming in here for the first time and, you know, welcome to the show. And he's, you know, looking for, you know, information and how to learn. And one thing, you know, less than that, you know, I'll give you from my 18 years experience is you make more money in the long term selling options than you do buying options. But the one thing is you don't ever want to leave yourself open ended. And that's, you know, where Nick Shaheen comes in here and he always, you know, if he's selling a put, he'll buy a lower put so that he limits his losses in case of, you know, that event that's going to take you out. So, you know, just naked selling options. I never advise, I, you know, if you're going to if you're bearish a stock or if you're bullish a stock, maybe you want to let's say, you know, you're bullish the TLT. Instead of, you know, coming here, buying the 118 calls, you know, write the 116 puts and then you're bringing money in and then maybe you buy the 114 puts or the 113 puts below it to give yourself some protection in the event that there's a real collapse. Now, TLT usually isn't going to have moves like that, but, you know, that's a different setup. So why not bring the premium in? You can still make a bullish bet by writing options. You know, you just go and write the put instead of buying the call. And uh, one thing that Dennis and you're alluding to is that, you know, when you're selling options, you know, you don't necessarily have to be super right, right? Because if let's let's say you let's say you know, let's use one seventeen as a marker here. You know, if you're selling, you know, the one one fourteen put for a buck, you're in at one thirteen. You know, if it just stays in the same area, you know, a buck you or money. two, you're gonna make money. And I think yeah. that's what uh, I think with a lot. That's a lot of thing that uh, people need to realize is that. Time is on your side when you're selling them. Of course, there's a yes. lot of risk in selling out, you know, and selling puts, covered puts, um, you know, a lot of things that you need to have. But, uh, Spencer, do you, uh, you've been kind of quiet today. Are you worried about that Maryland game tomorrow? No, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I mean, I am, but that's not why I'm quiet. I, I don't know. Why am I quiet? I have no idea. I, I, I'm, I'm too busy watching, uh, watching the financials and thinking about the, uh, the the tax returns, but I'm not gonna. We're not gonna talk about that. We're not gonna talk about that. About your tax returns the, the, from last night. The, oh, we're, okay. we're not talking about oh, that. That's that's not a good thing. All right. Uh, if there's any more stocks in the chat here, uh, I know Ace is putting some of the pre-market movers in here. So uh, we talked about Cool A R N A. Do we ha- have any news on that today? I think that's a is that a pharmaceutical stock. Uh, that's yeah, it's one of those little dogs that are, and like we were saying, some of these small little biotech penny stocks or dollar stocks have been popping lately. And here's another 23% in a small little one. That's been left for dead. I mean, this stock has done nothing for the better part of a couple of years. Getting a little lift here this morning. A lot of these lifts are short term. So, you know, these are ones like when you get in these things, it's good to have a shorter time horizon because it seems like long term, these things don't tend to work themselves out. But, you know, you do get these little 100, 200% pops. Sometimes this one's a smaller one, only 21% pop here this morning. But um, it is lifting. I don't know what the news is here this morning. Dollar forty-two to a dollar seventy-three, though. Pretty high volume too. Already nine hundred and seventy-three thousand shares have traded. So heavily priced up here at buck seventy-four on whatever news this is. All right, uh, we have earnings before the open tomorrow in Dollar General here. Now let's see. This stock has been hit a couple times here from ninety-two. You had a big gap down, never recovered. Formed a rounding bottom here. Rally, boy, I'll tell you, this is a tough chart here going into earnings. I mean, overall, I mean, things haven't been that rosy for, you know, the retail sector. I don't know. I would, for Dollar General, obviously, you know, going into earnings, it's a, a real crapshoot as you don't even know how they react, even if you have the number. I'd say right now, looking at major resistance, uh, up near the seventy-four dollar levels, three seventy-nine and three eighty-three are your three and four-day highs. Coming back on the downside here, you have a double bottom and a seventy-one handle. Dennis, any uh, any opinions on DG? I'll just tell you, these dollar stores can really move on an earnings report. So you know you're coming in and saying, okay. If you're coming into this, expect a three or four point move. You know, this things do move like that. I think if it gets hit, $70 comes into play once again. Would need to hold that level where you put those four bottoms in in January. And if it pops up, I mean, the major resistance is well defined here too. It's 78 bucks. So it's not out of the norm, 
where these things can move four or five points on an earnings report. We saw Dollar Tree there, you know, gapping up, I think it was like 10 or 15 points back in, in November. And then we saw it in December gapping down 10 points. So, I mean, these things do move on earnings and their retailers and retailers have been wild on their earnings reports as well. Um, you know, they're a little bit different animal. You know, a lot of the other retailers are very, really hurting, but you know, some of these dollar stores have held up okay. I don't know if I'm jumping in, though, ahead of the report, just because there's a lot of risk and they've really been moving around. All right. Well, we're going to wrap things up. we got one more guest coming on. Spencer, we do. We have a guy. Yeah, your own Glover has got a company called I Know First, and they have their own sort of predictive algorithms that they use to uh, predict uh, equity prices. And since we last spoke to your own, I think he's added uh, like a thousand more assets to his algorithm platform. Uh, so we're going to talk about the financials and what he thinks they would do ahead of uh, today's uh, Fed meeting and then afterwards. So we'll be right back with your own Golger from I Know First. All right, welcome back, traders and investors. This has been Zynga's Pre-Market Prep. I'm Spencer Israel here with Joel O'Connor. We're on the line now with Jerome Golger. He's the co-founder and CEO of a company called I Know First out in Israel. Jerome, how's it going, uh, I guess, this afternoon for you? Yes, uh, the, the time now is uh, 3 o'clock this afternoon. All right. Hello, Joel. Uh, hi, Spencer. Thank you for having me, guys. Thanks for joining us today. So tell us a little bit about uh, I Know First. That you were on the show last summer. Uh, give us a quick primer, though, about the platform and what you guys uh, offer. Sure. Uh, I Know First uh, brings science and math uh, to the stock market by providing daily investment forecast that based on uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, we are using self-learning algorithm that uh, generate a daily forecast for more than 3,000 assets, including stocks, uh, indices, ETFs, interest rates, currencies, and commodities. And the algorithm is uh, discovering the best investment opportunities on a daily basis. Um, the algorithm, um, the technology that, uh, that we are using, uh, we are using artificial intelligence, machine learning, artificial neural network, networks and genetic algorithms um, and we are using that in order to analyze and predict uh, the financial markets uh, we are using only quantitative da data and not um, and we are not using any traditional uh, models um, currently we are focusing on the US uh, stock market uh, but it's possible also to train the algorithm and to and to uh, focus on additional uh, stock exchanges we just just this week, we launched our uh, Japanese uh, channel, Japanese website that's focusing on the Nikkei. Uh, we have channels in Germany, Italy, uh, Brazil, and of course, uh, uh, Israel. So so how, how exactly did your uh, algorithms come about? How are they built? So um, the algorithm is, uh, it was uh, developed by Dr. Lipa Reutemann from the Weizmann Institute. Uh, is leading our R&D team. And uh, um, actually we are offering a restructured a tiered product offering. The first tier is the AI-based stock forecasting tool and the opportunity uh, scanner that identifying the best investment opportunities for institutionals and also for, for retail clients. On top of it, um, we developed an um, AI-based portfolio. We're converting the forecast into a portfolio, including the, the specific allocation rules. Uh, we developed uh, several systematic uh, trading and allocation strategies. Um, based on the S&P 500, the stock universe, uh, just in the last year, the AI algorithm had the return of uh, 77%. Uh, percent. 
with a sharp ratio of uh, 4.6, and this is the, the, the solution that's available especially for uh, mainly for institutional banks, hedge funds, and uh, family offices. Okay, so we we have this um, we have this mm-hmm. Fed meeting yes. today, you know, we have this Fed meeting later on today. Right. Uh, what does your right. algorithm say about the financial sector right now? Okay, um, the algorithm has a bullish uh, forecast um, for some uh, some uh, banks such as uh, Goldman Sachs and uh, J.P. Morgan. There is also, we can see also a positive prediction also for uh, banks from uh, not only in the U.S., but also uh, banks that uh, from Brazil and uh, India. Uh, we have also positive uh, forecast for the Bank of America. So mainly I can say that uh, um, currently the, the prediction uh, for, for, the, for the Linux banks is, is positive. Um, from the tech sector, um, the algorithm is uh, as a bullish signal for Amazon, uh, CRM, and also Apple and Netflix are really interesting, especially for the for the long term. Now, are, are these are these ratings available on on your site for anybody to look at? Yes, uh, every day the algorithm is generating a rolling forecast with uh, the best uh, daily opportunities. And um, uh, the algorithm every day is learning, uh, learning the patterns that are relevant to the market uh, today and identifying um, and delivering the forecast and also identifying the best opportunities, of course. And then what is the time horizon on the algorithm? Um, currently, we have uh, uh, several time horizons. We, have, uh, we are offering prediction for three days. Uh, seven days, 14 days, uh, one month, three months, and one year. Um, it's easy to predict. Um, usually the predictability of the long term is much higher than the short term. However, we are offering also for uh, institutionals um, short-term predictions. We have, spe- uh, we have special models that focusing on the short term and this is uh, usually um, available to to edge funds and uh, uh, banks. Gotcha. So you're selling the algorithm to 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 both the institutions and and to uh, the retail investor. That's correct. This is correct. The the first year with the AI based forecasting is available to retail clients and uh, institutional clients. And the second year. The, the, the portfolio itself the, or the, the different strategies uh, are available for, for institutionals uh, only. So what are there any other, so obviously you guys cover the, the entire uh, U.S. equities market. Are, are there any other uh, sectors that the algorithm is particularly bullish or bearish on? Um. We spoke about the, the financial uh, uh, sector. Uh, we have uh, also, uh, um, we can see that the tech sector is also interesting, at least uh, at least for the for the short term. Um, we we can see also recovery. Uh, we can see that the Brazilian stock exchange is going to continue is. Uh, is recovery process that we that we saw during the last uh, year, and it's going also to affect uh, the Brazilian stocks that uh, traded in, in the U.S. stock exchange, of course. Um, so, if I if to sum up, I, I think that the technology sector is uh, is the most interesting right now. We've been on the line with Jerome Golger. He's the co-founder and CEO of I Know First. Uh, that's the site, I know first.com. Uh, your own, I hope we'll see you at the Benzinga Fintech Awards this year. I know you were there last year. I hope we'll see you at, at the awards yeah. again in May this year. Yeah, I hope to see you too, guys, and uh, and to meet you in person. All right, that's your own, Goger. Your own, thanks a lot for joining us today. Have a good rest Thank of your day. You. Thank you very much for having me. Bye bye. 
And that's it for pre-market prep today. Uh, hope you enjoyed that. Hope you enjoyed our chat with Alice as well. Alice Andres France from MT Newswires and your own your own Google from I Know First. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Please remember that all the information, material, and content from our show is for informational purposes only and not meant to be investing advice. We'll see you all on Thursday. Whether you're a short-term swing trader or a long-term investor, you need to check out Thinkorswim, brought to you by TD Ameritrade. There's a reason why Thinkorswim has been named the number one trading platform, because it has it all. With Thinkorswim, you can trade stocks, options, futures, forex, and virtually every other type of order. Get notifications on mobile devices and interact with other traders in chat rooms. You can also use technical indicators and see the latest investing and trading education in Think Money magazine. If you want to keep up with the markets, you need Thinkorswim. To experience everything Thinkorswim has to offer, open a TD Ameritrade account today. Thinkorswim, the online trading platform for traders and investors. TD Ameritrade, member SIPC. All investing involves risks.